today's time of timers are Board Treasurer Linda Usinson and Board Member Emily Warden. Thank you so much. The rules for the Fanny Clock session are on your tables. Please review them prior to the question and answer session. Remember, only board members and young typers may ask the question. If you want to become a member of Type Ray right now, see Mom, she'll sign you right up. Oh, sorry. Members, Type Ray members. So only Type Ray members and, and young typers may uh, ask the question. Uh, you may only ask a single question. There are no exceptions. We ask you not to make a speech, please. And also, raise your hand, wait for the microphone so that Monica will come over and bring it to you so that way you state your name clearly. Rating today's train of clock questions are several board members in the audience Vice President Art O'Hara, Mayor Pat Gerard, Past Mayor David Fisher, Neil McMullen, and Kim Black. Staffing the microphone is your executive director, Monica Kyle. At this time, I would like to invite board member Rich Piper to introduce the program. Rich. Thank you, Anne. We tigers have been hearing and reading a great deal about potential Democratic and Republican candidates for governor of Florida who might run in 2014. Or then again, who might not. Is Senator Nelson going to seek to move from Washington to Tallahassee Governor's County? Maybe yes, maybe no. Looks like more no than yes. Will former Republican Governor Charlie Crist now make a bid as a Democrat to try to gain another term as governor? Yeah. Probably, but he's not saying. Will Alex Sink, who lost narrowly to Rick Scott in 2010, seek to reverse that outcome in a second race against Scott? Will some prominent Republicans Adam Putnam decided to challenge the governor for re-election. While the mass media have been regaling us with all these possibilities, they paid very slight attention so far to the one major downgrading gubernatorial candidate who has clearly declared her candidacy and has been actively crisscrossing Florida for many months. She's been spreading her message that we need to create a Florida where all people are created with are treated with respect where the middle class can grow and prosper, where children reach their full potential, and where seniors enjoy full and vigorous life. Today we have, have as our guest in the Tiger's Den, Senator Nan Rich, the only declared Democratic candidate for the governorship. Nan Rich has a distinguished record of public service, representing a Broward County district in Florida House of Representatives from 2000 to 2004, before gaining election to the Florida Senate in the latter year and rising to become the Democratic leader in the Senate. The mass media tell us that Nan Rich lags in the public opinion polls, has raised only limited campaign funds, and lacks the statewide recognition of Bill Nelson, Charlie Chris, Alex and Rick Scott, and Adam Button. One local journalist recently turned her, turned her the invisible Nan. She's actually been pretty visible. She has been everywhere in the state. Even a recent poll showing Senator Nick Rich leading Governor Scott 55% to 45% has been brushed aside by most pundits. They say, oh, her margin was less than that of the other Democrats in the survey. What we hope to learn today is whether Nan Rich has a persuasive and distinctive message and the drive to win that might enable her to emulate such other underdogs as Ruben Askew and Bob Graham, who have reached the governor's mansion despite my initial obstacles, or whether she is likely to be a mere footnote in the history of the 2014 gubernatorial race. Without further ado, I'm pleased to give you Senator Nanich. Democratic uh, minority leader 
first woman elected to that position by her peers. was almost over and it said, oh, you know, the Democrats uh, are invisible. And I thought, really? I said, what happened to that Karen Trigger bill? No? Whatever happened to prison privatization in 2012? Whatever happened to women's reproductive rights in 2012? The first year in May that we had not a single bill pass that curtailed or put barriers front of women's reproductive rights. So, you know, the accusations can be there, but uh, as my former colleague Charlie Justice knows, I'm not invisible. That is the term. I would, you know, connect myself to it. I want to just say uh, how great it is to see Charlie in his new position. Uh, he just showed me a wonderful picture of his daughters, and uh, I remember when they were born because he was in the legislature then. Uh, and we sat right next to each other, commiserating, uh, being Democrats in the background. Uh, so I'm really thrilled about his new position, and I'm anxious to get on with my new position. So as you know, I am running for governor. And uh, in November 2014, obviously the voters in this state will choose who they want to lead for the next four years to lead the state. Um, and I suggest, first of all, that they pick a leader, which is something that I think is questionable today. As I go through some of my remarks, um, I think you'll probably agree with me. As was mentioned, I have been going around the state for over a year, and I fortunately, someone said, well, you know, how do you, how do you pick places to go? Do you, uh, do you call them? And I said, well, fortunately, I haven't had to do that. People have really been wanting me to come and talk to them. And I will say that it is, um, there's a large majority of, of women's organizations and women in the Democratic Party who are anxious for there to be a woman Democratic governor. So they have been very supportive. And I have traveled to over 200 events now in this state, crisscrossing, as was mentioned, and really taking time to not only introduce myself to the voters, which obviously there are places in this state where I am a total unknown, um, but not only to introduce myself, but to listen and hear what people have to say. What are the issues and concerns that, uh, that they care about? And I will say that for many of the issues, they, um, they run across the entire state. When you look at public education, public education is probably the strongest issue that I hear about everywhere, from the Panhandle down to the East. People want their children to have the opportunity to go to good quality public schools. And I mentioned about the Parent Trigger Bill. When uh, in 2012, when we defeated that bill, um, I was a Democratic leader, but um, there were 12, 12 Democrats out of 40. So obviously, you can't do anything by yourself. You have to work across the aisle and get votes on the other side. And that's what I worked to do. And on the very last day of session, that bill was defeated on a 2020 vote. Twelve Democrats and eight Republicans who decided that it wasn't good for public education to allow for-profit management companies to take over our public schools. Um, it came back again this year, and uh, it was defeated by the same, by the same vote. Those of you who may not be aware, though, it was, a four, it was 14 Democrats and six Republicans because we had picked up two seats in the, uh, in the state house, in the state senate. And uh, so my successor, Chris Smith, had to round up six votes, which, uh, which he did. But it would be nice if that didn't come back again. And uh, one, of the, one of the goals that I would have is, as governor would be that that bill would not come back again that uh, I could work with uh, colleagues both in the House and the Senate and ensure that we focus on quality public education, which includes, by the way, charter schools, but not for-profit management companies running those charter schools. In my district, I had a fabulous uh, charter school city district in the city of Pendle Pines. They are a wonderful charter school program. And there are thousands of children who go to that school, and it's, it's a, a wonderfully, wonderfully um, uh, considered and rated school. Um, when 
when the governor ran in 2010, you know, um, he used the kind of catchphrase, let's get to work. Well, some of us didn't really know what that meant when, uh, when his administration began and when the Republican controlled legislature joined uh, with, this, with his agenda. But his agenda really was, um, this is how they did get to work. They worked to make it harder for people to vote. Remember, we had a terrible voter suppression bill in, 20, uh, in 2011. They worked to undermine public education, as I've mentioned. They worked to restrict women's reproductive rights, fortunately, not successfully, uh, in 2012. And they worked to block the radiance from the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. None of these initiatives, none of these things created one job in the state of Florida. And that's what the governor ran on, jobs, jobs, jobs. Some of you may notice that as you listen to him respond in press conferences or when the press asks him a question about something, the answer usually has to do with jobs. So I actually wish that uh, some of the opportunities that were placed before him were ones that he would have um, kind of taken up on. The first one, of course, and a lot of this has to do with money that has been returned to the federal government or not drawn down from the federal government that should be our money. Florida taxpayers paid it in taxes to Washington, and we're not getting our fair share of that. We are a donor state. And we came, we have become a much worse donor state under uh, this administration. And I'll just mention a couple of items. One of you know very well here, the $2.4 billion that was returned for high-speed rail. A lot of work went into that. Legislators, like John Micah and others in, in Congress who worked hard to get that money for Florida, and then it was gone. <clears throat> and um, that would have created the lowest estimation that I've seen is 20,000 new jobs. And let me tell you that the governor mentioned that the money, we couldn't take the money because of the deficit to the, the United States government. Well, and that this would help reduce that deficit. No, that's not what happens. And I'll tell you one quick story to show it. Um, I'm very involved in foster care issues and children aging out of the foster care system. And the Congressional Foster Care Caucus met in South Florida a number of months ago. And the Congresswoman, Karen Bass from California, came in for the meeting. And she came over to me when I walked into the meeting and she said, she introduced herself and very effusive and said, thank you so much. And I said, well, what? I have never met you. She said, for the one billion dollars for high-speed rail, one billion of our 2.4 billion went to California, and the California legislature has approved the final leg of the high-speed rail from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So that's what happened to our money. Then we had uh, also monies that were not accepted for uh, to protect children from child abuse and to keep frail seniors out of nursing homes. So those were in the tens of millions of dollars. But most recently, as many of you are aware, the governor and legislature um, refused to accept $51 billion of federal funds, again, our tax dollars, for the expansion of the Affordable Care Act. Now, um, this has a number of really terrible, terrible ramifications. Number one, of course, is the people issue and the people prospect here of 1.2 million Floridians going off the uninsured roles and having health insurance. So we start with that. Then we get to the hospitals. When you, when you realize that you have 1.2 million new people on the health care roles, you realize how many people will be coming to the hospitals. So the subsidies that were there before, before the Affordable Care Act, go away. And that was done on purpose by the Obama administration, because the Medicaid expansion money is supposed to pick up that slack. That money is replaced by the Medicaid expansion money. Now, if you don't take the Medicaid expansion money and the subsidies go away, you know, it doesn't take a math teacher to tell you what happens to your hospital budgets. And what happens is that uh, they are devastated, especially those that are safety net hospitals and hospitals that 
uh, like your children's hospitals, all children's hospital here, and Miami Children's Hospital, because their Medicaid rate of patient is over 70%. So if you have no money to cover their costs, what is going to happen? The other thing has to do with jobs again. The University of Florida came out with a study that shows that if you take the Medicaid money, you now have to create uh, positions for people to treat all of these new patients. And they estimate 120,000 new good jobs would be created. These are high-paying healthcare jobs in the state of Florida, throughout the state of Florida. So those are, are kind of the issues that um, really are very distressing about not taking this Medicaid money. I also want to mention, um, and, and, and by the way, it shows a lack of leadership. I talked about leadership. Because the governor has been opposed to the Affordable Care Act way before he became governor. Then all of a sudden, right before this session, he said he supports Medicaid expansion. Well, if you say you support something, or you, you let it happen, then you, you have to show some leadership. You have to do something about it. He did nothing about it because he didn't even speak to the Senate President or the Speaker of the House. And as you know, Speaker Weatherford was the one that really killed the, the whole thing. But he never sat down and spoke to him. You need to work together. I mean, I talked to you about working together with people across the aisle who are of a different party. Here, he has people of his own party in the positions of power, and they all should have sat down together and figured out how we could get $51 million into the budget of the state of Florida. And let me tell you, if you look at a state like Arizona, and Arizona, Jan Brewer, she actually was against Medicaid, you know, for years. She actually even cut her programs in Arizona. But you know what? All of a sudden, when the money became available for Medicaid expansion, she figured it out. And she fought her own legislature and got that money and got that money approved for the state of Arizona. And we should have done the same thing here in Florida. Um, I guess put simply, there are a few decisions that Governor Scott has made that I believe were in the best interest of people. Um, that's why I am running for governor. A majority of Floridians don't want private for profit corporations taking over our schools. A, major a majority of Floridians want health care coverage to be available and accessible for everyone. A majority of Floridians believe that women's reproductive rights should be protected and that women should have the right to control their own bodies and their own lives. And there is no doubt that the majority of Floridians believe that the right to vote has to be protected and encouraged by their government, not made a political tool. I am, uh, the subject came up about uh, Charlie Crist. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I am a lifelong Democrat. I'm a progressive Democrat. I have potentials to prove it 12 years in the Florida legislature. Uh, I'm running on those credentials, and I feel that when anyone comes into this race, um, that's what the voters will do. First, the Democratic primary voters will decide who has the best credentials based on their values and principles, on the Democratic Party's values and principles. And then, in a general election, obviously all the voters you know, will decide. Uh, I feel I am prepared. <coughs> governor as a result of my experience before I came to the legislature. Uh, some of you may not be aware, I have some colleagues sitting here who have worked with me for many years, uh, and uh, Audrey and Sheila, and uh, I was the uh, first Floridian to be elected president, national president of the National Council of Jewish Women, and I've worked on a lot of these issues for many, many, many years. Uh, and I feel I have the passion, the experience, and the knowledge to, uh, to be the governor. And I also know that I have the leadership because of what I have accomplished already. Uh, Rich mentioned about um, not being, you know, knowing around the state. And I, I always tell people a little bit of Florida history. Um, it kind of serves my purpose, but it's true. Uh, when Ruben Askew ran for governor, he was a little known state senator from Central, from Northern Florida. As a matter of fact, one of the women up there, I've been up there three times, and she said, you know, you've been up here more than any candidate I've seen, other than Ruben asked you when he lived here. <laughs> so, and then I will get to Lot Chops in 1970. He ran for the U.S. Senate, uh, Walker Rodden, and he uh, was a little known state senator from Central Florida. And then Bob Graham, who's been a, a, a friend and colleague of mine for, for many years, and um, he was a little known state senator from South Florida. And I remember because I supported him. Name recognition when he started running for governor. 
started, but they all won. And I believe uh, that I'm going to follow in their footsteps by going out and doing what I'm doing, getting voters to know who I am, and getting that broad grassroots support across this state. And in November of uh, 2014, I plan on being elected the first woman governor of the state of Florida. Uh, two Saturdays in a 
Grove, where they left the Capitol. And the first day was really remarkable. I, had, I spent, uh, I spent actually over two hours with them. I spoke briefly, and then I just kind of opened it up. They're all sitting on the floor outside the governor's office, um, and these are incredible young adults uh, in college. Some of them had graduated from college, talking about uh, why they were there. So I was asking them, "Why are you here? Why are you protesting? What do you think you can accomplish?" And they told me incredible stories, you know, about their lives and about racial profiling, about the disparities that exist in the criminal justice laws and the juvenile justice system in the state of Florida. And these are the things that we have to now work on. They'll all be back to testify during committee weeks, and we have to ensure that we work hard to get that legislation changed and the disparities corrected. <laughs>
assessment senior evaluation system that has credibility, works, and makes sense in the local community, and is sustainable. Let me start first with the, look, this is a long question, and I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get to the whole answer, but with the, the time we have. But I'm going to say that this is the farce, this uh, educational summit. It was called on a Thursday and it began on Monday. There are no parents, no parent groups represented as stakeholders from any of the people that have been advocating about the accountability system that came to Tallahassee. Uh, to um, to work to defeat the parent trigger bill, you have you know, none of these people are the stakeholders. It is a stacked deck, as far as I'm concerned. And I actually wrote a tweet about it that said that one of the one of the uh, the, uh, the outcome of this uh, of this summit uh, is about as undecided as the House Criminal Justice Committee that's going to hear the standard ground uh, law chaired by Matt Gates. I mean, it is. It, the people are there. They're picked for a certain reason. Parents aren't properly represented. There are two people. There is a principal. I mean, the, the, there is a uh, principal from the Delray area, and then there's Alberto Carvalho from the Miami Dade Public Schools. They are the only ones speaking out, and it's uh, you know it's a preordained you know outcome. And I don't think that's what we need to do. Uh, I believe that this system is broken. I began in the legislature in 2000, which is right after we started with this grading system. The grading system needs to be reviewed. It is, uh, it is an inappropriate way, in, in my view, as someone who's been involved, has four children who have gone through public schools, my three grandchildren are in public schools. Uh, I see what has happened because of FCATs. We need to have a really legitimate uh, uh, analysis of everything that's going on here, and not by legislators. This summit has more legislators on it than it has educators on it. I would like to see educators, people that have knowledge, come together and help present uh, ideas and principles that we can put in place uh, in this state to have a proper grading system and to make sure that we have a you know, proper evaluation of our teachers, make sure that our, that our school is a quality school system. I'm Irene Sullivan, Senator Rich, thank you for coming today. Um, this morning on TV, uh, the very conservative Republican governor of Michigan, Rick Snyder, was explaining why his state accepted the Medicaid expansion. And he said it was really simple because they figured out that a healthier Medicaid population would reduce Medicaid costs eventually. And it was a very fiscally sound thing to do. So as a leader of the Democrats in Tallahassee, have you ever thought, or maybe I have, you haven't heard it until just now, but it would be a good idea to invite another side down to drum some sense into the Republicans in Tallahassee? I, I, I don't know if I can answer that one. <laughs> I, I actually don't think, uh, you know, this is about rigid ideology. This is about, personally, a dislike of the President of the United States not wanting him to succeed in, in, in what he does. I mean, let, let me tell you, the Affordable Care Act is not perfect. There, there are changes that should be made to it. But unlike other laws, where people have been able to come back and change things, even if you look at, at Social Security and Medicare, where laws have changed over the years, they can't because everybody's stuck in the mud and there's no ability to, to work things through and to fix some of the problems, some of the issues. But I, I do agree with the governor in that it will reduce costs because the most expensive costs are when people go to our emergency rooms. So what, what we want to try and do is keep people out of our emergency rooms. If they're not insured, they're not going to be out of our emergency rooms. They're not going to be going to their doctors for an earache or, or uh, you know, a sore throat or something. They're going to end up when it's more severe and they'll end up in our emergency rooms. And we all pay for that and we all know that. Kelly Kirshner, uh, Young Tiger 448. That's my first question as a Tiger too. Uh, Senator Rich, you, you just mentioned the, the intractable problem of hardened ideology in Tallahassee, and I think all of us are familiar with the problems with gerrymandering, that we really don't have competitive districts for House races or Senate races. Uh, so I would pose to you the question, it, 
people will say, just for practicality then, we should have a really centrist GOP governor in permanently until we have competitive fair districts. And I, so my question for you would be, as a Democrat sitting in the governor's mansion, what you could do in, in terms of actually implementing an agenda with a legislature that we believe will continue to be controlled by the GOP. Oh my God, you need to do that for the questions. <laughs> Um, well, I would totally disagree that it should be a centrist, uh, you know, Republican uh, governor. Uh, I think, you know, I actually think it's good to have a, a mix of, you know, people from different parties. And I've already explained that uh, I'm, I'm not one of these people that, you know, will not provide leadership to be able to get things done. You know, when I look at the governor, uh, another example is uh, the assisted living uh, bill that we had two years in a row that failed 40 nothing. I had it the first year, and this year you know, it, it passed 40 nothing in the Senate and never got a hearing in the, in the House. Now, if you're the governor and you have created a task force, you've publicly said that you think that the laws need to be changed to protect our most vulnerable seniors, then why aren't you over there talking to the House and telling them this is on your agenda, this is your priority? Because you know what? All those people over there on the House side, they have bills they want passed, they have appropriations they want funded, and you know what? The governor has the power to veto those. And the good thing is that in the last election cycle, we no longer have a supermajority. So a Democratic governor could veto something, and the veto would not be overridden. Senator, if you would please call your last question. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Tuesday, September 10th, we will be hosting Speaker of the House Bill Weatherford at the St. Pete Marriott Clearwater. Wednesday, September 25th, we'll be hosting Pinellas County School Superintendent Michael Rego here at the Yacht Club. And now, what are you waiting for? The winner of the Bang Club, Bruce Crowder. <laughs>